Welcome to our last panel, which is Race and Drugs, Then and Now. We have two speakers. Our first one is Dr. Jill McCorkle, who is also from the Department of Sociology and Criminology here at Villanova. And she will be presenting on From Smack to Crack and Back Again. I'm a poet. <laughs> Oh, you want me to go now? Go for it. All right. <laughs> That's this great. is why they separated us. I'm a poet. <laughs> uh, well, in preparing this uh, talk today, I came across an op-ed yesterday by Jay-Z, who is the rapper and now um, very wealthy media mogul. And Jay-Z got a little bit of a jump on me with respect to this talk. So let me tell you a, a bit about what he had to say yesterday, and then I'm going to um, move in a slightly different trajectory than him. But in his New York Times op-ed, which P.S. I highly recommend, he was decreeing the fact that the war on drugs was an abject failure. And in describing it as a failure, he cited, among other things, the explosive growth in the prison population, the persistent mythology that crack and cocaine, crack and powder cocaine are somehow fundamentally different drugs, and that crack in particular is a quote-unquote black drug. That, with effects that are more dangerous than any other drug that's previously been seen on American streets. The impact of this mythology was a near-exclusive law enforcement focus on communities of color and locking up millions of African Americans and Latinos at historically and globally unprecedented rates. The irony, of course, is that white Americans use cocaine in both its forms at rates that were higher than African American drug use and, and cocaine use. Uh, so from in 1991, when the National uh, Institute of Drug Abuse examined user rates of both powder and crack cocaine, they found that whites were, had the highest rates of cocaine uses, and in, of crack use in particular, 52% of crack users were white, 38% were African American, and that, those statistics uh, persist today, even though cocaine use is down among Americans today. So Jay-Z talks about some of that, and then he moves on to examining the racial hypocrisy of American drug policy by considering who's profiting from the legalization of marijuana. And in the event you don't know, here's a hint. The very people who were locked up for marijuana crimes during the war on drugs are now legally prohibited from participating in legal marijuana markets by virtue of their felony convictions. Instead, the profiteers are white, middle class, and upper middle class individuals who weren't arrested and convicted during that period. So, that's Jay-Z, <laughs> sets the bar high. Um, from, from my talk today, I want to think about race and drug policy, and I want to actually move backward and provide more of a historical context. Jay-Z's looking forward, and I want to look back. Um, but one thing that's true of American drug policy over the 200 plus years or so that we have been trying to regulate uh, drugs is that our sense of whether a substance is dangerous and our response to that sense of danger has been historically always influenced by considerations of race. The history of American drugs is a fascinating one, and I'm only going to prevent, provide a little sample today. But if you look at it over time, what you'll see is that uh, drug policies and drug legislation tend to move in waves. And those waves begin in late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, and it's at that period that opium and a lot of opium derivatives that were widely used in the US, and they're widely used among the American white middle class and upper middle class, and they're routed primarily through the medical industry um, and in, um, and in med like med <coughs> medicine sales, those little traveling cough syrups and whatnot, of which I'll give you some, some flavor. Um, so that's, it's the early opium use that is, kicks off the beginning of American drug policy uh, right up through the present. And if we look at those different waves as it moves from regulation of opium to heroin to cocaine to marijuana, um, what we find is a couple of characteristics. The first of which is that we have a faddish preoccupation with particular drugs at particular times. So for example, there's a panic about marijuana in the 1920s. There's a heroin crisis, quote unquote, in the 1960s. And then of course, there's the crack attack in the mid-1980s. Secondly, there's been an ongoing tension in each of these waves between a quote-unquote medical or therapeutic approach to drug control and a punitive one. The tension is framed in a larger cultural context 
in terms of how we view addiction, whether we see addiction as a moral shortcoming or a psychological problem or disease, and who we identify as addicts, both demographically and otherwise. Third, shifts in drug policy are generally driven by politics and cultural panics more so than they are by science or by actual trends in drug use and drug problems, which is very important as we can consider uh, what's happening, particularly in the era of crack cocaine. And then finally, drug policy is politics by other means. And by that I mean that drug policy at different points has offered symbolically expedient ways to control specific groups of people who are regarded at different points in times as, as economic or political threats. And for this reason, drug policy in all its guises, whether it's been medicalization or it's been prohibition, has never been terribly effective in resolving drug use, but it has served to protect the economic and social position of elites. And so with that, I'm just going to give you uh, two waves of American drug policy. Uh, the first one uh, focusing on opium and heroin in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and then the second one, my favorite drug, which is crack cocaine in the mid-1980s. Everyone should have a favorite drug. And Crack is mine, uh, where I came of age as an intellectual um, studying uh, crack distribution on the streets and crack penalties in the prison system. So for the first uh, wave of drug policy, we situate ourselves roughly in the Civil War era, which is like 1861 to 1865, and through the end of that century. At that time, the use and sale of opium, morphine, cocaine, and other psychoactives was legal, and in fact, use of these drugs was quite normative in the US. They were frequently prescribed by physicians, but beyond that, a variety of medicines were available without a prescription. Uh, you could get them at your grocery store, and if your grocery store didn't carry your medicine of choice, you could uh, order it by mail. Most of the opium in the US during this period was legally imported. Morphine was manufactured here with imp legally imported opium. And opium poppies were also legally grown here. And you can see from these ads, this uh, first one is syrup of tar, which contains alcohol, chloroform, and heroin, and the promise is that it will cure your cold, and I bet that's true. <laughs> I, bet, I bet it did. <laughs> uh, so this, is, uh, this drug is around in the 1900s, and then uh, here's Miss, Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup, um, today probably called Cizerp. If, for those of you who are following it. Uh, this is uh, comprised of morphine. Uh, so these drugs were being marketed to middle-class white families and upper-middle-class white families. Uh, they were in widespread use. It's not until, now, it's not as if there weren't problems associated with the use of this drug, and it's not that those problems didn't, didn't get on the radar. So actually, by 1911, the American Medical Association published a pamphlet that was intended as an educational pamphlet to be distributed among the American public, and it was called Quack, Quack Medicine. And in the categories of quack medicine, there were sort of these subcategories, and one of the subcategories was baby killers, under which Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup was listed, because indeed there were infants who died as a result of being given this uh, medicine from their families. So there were uh, whites who were using quite, in fact, they represent the majority of users during this period and who are getting addicted. But that isn't what triggers criminalization of opium and various opium-related Products. In fact, the view of opium, that it's not somehow normative or that it's not benign, doesn't begin to shift until it is connected to uh, Chinese laborers and, and becomes linked to a specific economic and racial threat that they pose. There's, um, if we go back to San Francisco in roughly the 1870s, there's a wave of anti-Chinese violence and protest that begins on the streets of San Francisco. And the reason for that um, had to do with shifts in the California economy. So Chinese men, as you may or may not know, had been brought uh, primarily to the western United States to build railroads and to work in the gold mines. Um, and for some of these men, smoking opium was a widely accepted cultural practice in the way that happy hour, which I'll be attending later, is a widely accepted cultural practice today. Um, but when the economic recession hits in California, and there is no more railroad work, and there is no more uh, mine work, suddenly those men become problematized by white laborers, primarily because the pay that they're receiving for their work on the mines and on the railroads is much less than uh, white laborers are receiving. And so the concern is, with fewer and fewer jobs, uh, white men will be replaced by Chinese men. And so at this point, you get this wave of legislation against opium. Now, it's only the opium 
that is associated with being smoked and, it's, and, and being smoked in quote unquote dens. Uh, so the first, let me say, first law against smoking opium is passed in San Francisco in 1875. <coughs> and in essence, this becomes a way to racially target these unemployed Chinese laborers by re like literally physically removing them from the labor market and sending them to prison. Um, but it's not just about class politics with respect to what's happening with opium in the U.S. and the regulation of opium. It's also about race. And so this is a, an ad for a Broadway play, but you can see that here's a dime novel in the late 1800s, um, Hopley, the uh, Chinese slave dealer, and the reference to slavery here is to white slavery, that um, Chinese men in particular are using opium to sexually exploit and enslave white women and girls. Uh, and there's the, this very different portrayal of the white middle class opium user than what we saw in the ads that are running in the same period. Uh, so, this, so the argument with respect to the, the problematics of opium is attached specifically to Chinese as a distinct racial category. In fact, with the help of uh, tabloid kingpin uh, William R. Hurst, he claims that and runs a series of stories across um, newspapers throughout the U.S that uh, the drug specifically is being used to enslave white women, and that the ingestion of opium among Chinese men, but not among whites, that among Chinese men, it makes Chinese men in particular want to rape white women and girls. That it has a, a specific uh, psychoactive effect on Chinese men that it doesn't have for white men. So actually there's a series of laws that are passed throughout the country that in some cases criminalize opium when it's used by Asian men, but not when it's used by white men, on the premise that it has a different set of effects. Uh, and, and that set of claims, which by the way were entirely mythological, um, there's no uh, sort of uh, substance associated with this notion that, that white women were being moved into slavery or sexual exploitation in, in any significant way, but it had a profound effect and it launched American drug policy in this country. So that by 1914, 27 states had passed similar legislation uh, criminalizing opium and so-called opium dens. In contrast, if we go back to Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup, which the AMA declares as a baby killer in 1911, that drug, this drug, is not outlawed until 1931. It hangs on for 19 years, despite the fact that there's documented evidence of children, white children in particular, dying as a result of ingesting that. How am I doing on time? I have 15 minutes. Well, good. <laughs> I want to spend the rest of my 15 minutes on crack. <laughs> Did you bring it up? Um, <laughs> um, so let's uh, jump forward 100 years. Now, I can tell you that, that the sort of uh, patterns with respect to economic threat, racial threat, and racial claims making, and particularly racial claims making around um, white women's vulnerability, persist in these different drug waves throughout the next 100 year period. It happens with respect to the criminalization of marijuana. There the claim is that Mexican laborers are affected in ways that are very, very different when they ingest marijuana than how whites are affected when they ingest marijuana. Mexican laborers, when they ingest marijuana, become violent. That's not the case for whites. And so that uh, claim helps perpetuate the um, criminalization of marijuana. So this, this happens in these ways. This kind of racial claims making and the sense of economic threat seems to follow them. And it's also present in the crack cocaine crisis of the 1980s. So we'll jump forward 100 years. Now, this, is, this puts us right into the heart and soul of the war on drugs. And the war on drugs is sort of marked by sociologists like myself by two pieces of federal legislation, Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1984, Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986. And there's a couple notable things about that legislation, which the states are induced to adopt, and they are certainly welcome to go harsher than the federal penalties, uh, but they lose out on various in-kind federal benefits if they don't go as harsh as the federal penalties. Um, but what's notable? First of all, we get the mandatory minimums, which, are, which sort of ratchet up the severity of punishment for every illegal drug, but in particular for crack cocaine. In fact, crack cocaine becomes the first drug in American history in which a first offense for simple possession triggers a mandatory prison sentence. In September 1989, a federal judge in San Francisco openly wept in court uh, because the laws required that he, these laws required that he sentence a defendant to 10 years in prison without possibility of parole. This was the defendant's first offense. Up until this point, he had been gainfully employed for 24 years as a longshoreman. He had a reputation of being a good and honest worker. What was his crime? 
His crime was that he drove a friend across town to make a drug drop off. In exchange for that, he received $5. He was not the dealer, nor was, nor was he in any way a beneficiary, fiduciary, or otherwise of that transaction. But nonetheless, in these guidelines, it's the weight of the drug that triggers the sentence, not your role in the offense. So it doesn't matter if you're the buyer, or you're the seller, or you're the middleman, or you're the person in whose apartment other people are using. In fact, in New York in 1986, Judy Perez was sentenced 15 years to life in prison for possession after the police raided an apartment that she was in, not her apartment, and uh, she was there visiting. And when the police raided, they found heroin, cocaine, and some drug paraphernalia. She had no drugs on her person. She was not known and had no priors as a drug user. But nonetheless, she was convicted of the possession offense because she was in a room where drugs were openly visible. <laughs> it's a quite harsh sentencing scheme. And the penalties with crack in particular are also uh, notable. And I want to talk about that, in particular the 100 to 1 rule. So the 100 to 1 rule, for those of you who are unfamiliar, and yet I can't imagine that anyone in this room is at this point, is that 100 grams of powder cocaine it would take 100 grams of powder cocaine to trigger the same sentence as one gram of crack cocaine. But these aren't equivalents, pharmacologically or otherwise. So that the person who is possessing five grams of crack cocaine, who's going to do a mandatory five years in the feds, is not a drug dealer. Five grams of crack cocaine, as I often say to my students, is like the freshman that rolls in with a six pack of pounders like bush light pounders. <laughs> this is not, I trip over five grams of crack cocaine. I probably tripped over five grams of crack cocaine on my way here today, and I didn't notice them. You know why? Because it's five grams. It's, it's, it's not a lot of that particular drug. In fact, it's not even, even the equivalent pharmacologically of five grams of powder cocaine. Five grams of powder cocaine offers much more of a user uh, amount than five grams of crack because crack weighs more. These are the same exact substance, and if I were to test you leaving this room and you had just done some cocaine to make it through the rest of the afternoon, this talk in particular, uh, <laughs> uh, I wouldn't be able to tell it, whether you had smoked it as crack or whether you had sorted it as powder cocaine. Your body metabolizes it in exactly the same way. The difference in the substance, and the, the difference is not in the substance, the difference is in how you use it. So it is true that the crack high is different than the powder cocaine high, but that's because you smoke crack. And any drug that you smoke, it offers a more powerful high, a more a, a quick high in that you're up very, very fast and you're way up um, compared to drugs that you would ingest either nasally or orally. The reason for that has to do with how quickly that drug is able to pass the blood brain barrier. So when you smoke a drug, it's immediately hitting the receptors in your brain in a way that it's not when it has to travel through the rest of your bloodstream in the course getting cut down in its, um, in its potence. So, that's, so there is a difference in the high, but five grams of powder cocaine offers actually more usable drug than five grams of crack cocaine. And 500 grams of powder cocaine, now we're talking about two completely different individuals. These individuals don't run into each other at the grocery store because one's at Whole Foods and one's on the corner store. These individuals don't go to the same parties, they don't have the same friends, and they don't have anywhere near the same lifestyle. One of them is a very significant dealer, and the other one is a scrapper. Is kind of a scrapper. <laughs> not, uh, not a very successful one. <coughs> Now, what accounts for the difference in penalty? Because we know that that uh, 100 to 1 rule in particular is what lands a lot of people in prison and what gets them there for very long periods of time. It's hard to look at these penalties. And by the way, in, in 2010, part of the reason that my uh, chart cuts off in 2010 is 2010 is when the Obama administration uh, shifts that 100 to 1 rule. It's now an 18 to 1 rule. And that's been the result of a tremendous amount of scientific uh, testimony and lobbying over the course of, uh, at least since the mid-1990s, when people were concerned about this disparity, and the, and the disparity becomes evident very quickly in the prison system. So what accounts for it? It's impossible not to attribute the punitiveness to anything other than race. As I noted at the start of the presentation, 
Crack was, and still is, and in fact, I usually have to spend a good hour explaining to people that, that the majority of crack users are actually white. And I did research um, during the height of the war on drugs in the Delaware prison system. And you know, if you went into the Delaware prison system at the time and said, crack's a black drug, everyone would have just looked at you strangely. Because that, that definitely was not a category that people experienced on the streets. Um, it, was a, it really was an artifact of the media and, and of some of the debates that were happening uh, um, among politicians. So the media coverage is that crack is a black drug, and the law enforcement response shores that up by targeting uh, African American and Latino communities. And so where you see a disparity between crack cocaine and powder cocaine is in the arrest data, not in the self-report data. Uh, so African Americans, sure, uh, are the overwhelming majority of people who are uh, I'm sorry, arrested uh, for simple possession of crack cocaine, while whites are the majority of people who are arrested for simple possession of powder cocaine. And in fact, a US Sentencing Commission report in 2000 found that whites were less than 10% of those arrested by federal law enforcement for crack, compared to African Americans who were 84% of those arrested. This again, contrasts markedly from use data. These uh, patterns of arrest trigger a number of appeals through the court system, challenging the constitutionality of, among other things, the 100 to 1 rule. And by and large, the courts aren't terribly sympathetic to those claims. And the reason the courts aren't terribly sympathetic to those claims is because they fall back on the arguments that Congress made when they passed the 100 to 1 rule in the first place. And the, what Congress said was that we believe that crack cocaine is a drug that is more addictive than powder cocaine, and that also there's something about the psychoactive uh, triggering of crack that it causes its users to engage in violence. So it's these two things together that warrant uh, this fundamental uh, disparity in penalties. Now, if you want to talk to me later, I can tell you that because they're physiologically the same substance, crack isn't, more, isn't somehow more physiologically addicting than powder cocaine. There is an, a great deal of social science evidence looking at the abuse of crack cocaine among its users, uh, but that abuse of crack cocaine among the users has to do with uh, the nature of who's using, that it is people who are poor, and it's also the nature of the high, that because you go up very quickly, you also come down very fast. Uh, but, but are there people who use crack cocaine that don't have problems, that don't engage in repeated use? Of course. The majority of people who try crack cocaine never go on to use it again. And the majority of people who use it uh, more than a few times don't go on to use it on a regular basis. But let's accept, let's accept Congress's argument that it is an addictive drug. It then becomes that much more puzzling, the response. Because if we say that crack is more addicting than powder cocaine, one wonders why the sole response to it is lengthy prison sentences in American prisons that now are characterized by the absence of drug treatment and by various other kinds of therapeutic interventions. There are experimental drug courts that are emerging at the end of you know, the 1990s, but prior to that, it is, let's just lock everybody up for a five and 10 year bid. It's difficult to reconcile that then with today's uh, heroin crisis and opioid crisis more generally. Also, I want to say with respect to the claims about violence, it's also the case that there was uh, manifestations of violence in the early crack cocaine markets. That had to do with the disruption of, of distribution networks. And in fact, we see that, in, we see that same pattern uh, when new drugs come on the scene in general, because it, it undermines sort of longstanding territories of where distributors are, and then law enforcement is playing catch up. But that actually happens independent of the illicit substance. It's everything about the newness of the illicit substance and very little about the actual psych psychoactive effects of that particular substance. So it wasn't that crack somehow physiologically caused users to become violent. It is that there was something connected with that distribution network, which, by the way, the levels of violence begin to tail off as crack becomes, as sort of distribution of crack becomes normalized and stabilized as we move through the 1990s. One also wonders, since a lot of the media coverage of crack cocaine features quote unquote crack babies and children who are affected by crack, one also wonders about the nature of the response. And that response is single-mindedly punitive, even when there's a recognition that the children have done nothing wrong. Uh, so in 1997, we have a very aggressive uh, piece of federal legislation called the Adoption and Safe Families Act, 
that moved to terminate the parental rights of mothers who were convicted of drug use. Most of this was premised on cl claims that crack mothers in particular had passed their addiction onto their babies. Uh, in Delaware, the state that I was studying in the 1990s, in the uh, beginning of the epidemic, instituted something called Diamond Deliveries. Diamond Deliveries aimed to ensure that women who were uh, most vulnerable to drug use were getting the kind of uh, neonatal attention that their babies needed. So that meant regular delivery of prenatal vitamins, it meant checkups, and it also meant non-reporting on uh, any drug use. The goal was, to tr was harm reduction, and it was try to encourage people to seek treatment, but if they don't get treatment, let us at least make sure that the fetus is getting the appropriate amount of nutrition and oversight and everything else. That program was actually successful at uh, reducing the rates at which women were using, and it was canceled. It was canceled because it was a political football at the time. Finally, we get the juvenile predator, super predator laws, which are passed largely on the argument from criminologist John DeLulio that this generation of quote unquote crack babies is uh, missing the sort of moral temperament and intellectual capacity that the rest of us enjoy. And in fact, this uh, generation of super predators is uh, going to unleash a wave of violence and chaos across American cities. And so the response then must be not to deal with children that we think are born addicted to crack, but rather to subject them to increasingly harsher penalties in the juvenile justice system, if not adult transfer laws to just shift them over to the adult system entirely. All of this, so I'll, I'll wrap up. Yeah, I was just going to oh. be fine. <laughs> I can really get lost in my crack conversation. And I've done well here today because I've got a million stories, as you probably can imagine. Um, all of this stands in, in contrast very much to what we're seeing in the current moment. The media coverage of the opioid crisis is highlighting white, middle, and working class users. But these users are importantly not portrayed as social isolates, but often they're portrayed with their families. And their families are often narrating that this user is more than a user. That this user is a valuable, productive member of our society who's in a crisis. And we need to respond to that crisis in kind. Now, it would be tempting to say that our response to opioids is premised on what we now recognize as the error of our ways with respect to crack cocaine. And I believe in part that that's true. However, given what Jay-Z points out in that op-ed, which I'm really, really, go get that op-ed. <laughs> given what Jay-Z is pointing out about the failure right now for, of us making the past right, that we have yet to address the kind of systematic problems that we unleash in our response to the crack cocaine crisis. So families, entire families and communities and generations that are ravaged by this policy are, not, are still not able to get any kind of recourse in the current framework. And so it's hard to conclude that what, what is happening now is happening in any way that, that would appear to be race neutral. Thank you, Jill. Our next speaker is Dr. Helena Hansen, an assistant professor of psychiatry and anthropology at New York University. And I will talk slowly. She will be presenting on the war on drugs that wasn't. All right. So what this one? Okay. I just try to project. <laughs> She's just loud. I'm just loud, yeah. Okay. Well, I have to thank Jill McCorkle for not only a typically fantastic talk, but also for making the transition to my talk perhaps a little easier for you as an audience, um, because I'm going to give you a perspective that's pretty far outside of law enforcement. Let me get this slide back up. Um, it's really the perspective of a social scientist and psychiatrist who's doing research on the question that really speaks to a question that the nation is asking, which is why is the life expectancy of whites suddenly falling? Some of you may be familiar with this landmark article um, that made that proclamation. While the life expectancy of every other racial group in the country is rising. And um, actually, how did opioids become, become the primary immediate cause of excess death in the case of US whites? So my answer might be surprising. I'm going to argue that the current generation of opioids were designed to have raci white racial identities. And that in our stratified health care and, and justice systems, they reinforce racial disparities while at the same time harming whites. 
I encountered these questions in the 1990s as a medical student working in a primary care clinic that ran early clinical trials for buprenorphine, which is commercially known as Suboxone. You may have read about it as a treatment for opioid dependence now. Um, at the time, it hadn't gotten FDA approval, and my supervisors were excited about it as this new up-and-coming addiction treatment, which they said was about to, quote unquote, change the culture of medicine. Uh, it would um, make addiction mainstream, uh, establish it as a chronic biological illness, treatable alongside diabetes, hypertension, and asthma in the same clinics, primary care clinics, and in the same way with long-term pharmaceutical maintenance. So I was in this clinic um, at the beginning of a rise in prescription opioid use in the suburbs. Okay. Um, and this is when opioids became the most prescribed drug class in the U.S. for many years in a row. Overdose rates followed closely behind, and all of this was happening in the midst of a national move toward stop and frisk and sting operations in black and Latino inner city neighborhoods that led to unprecedented incarceration rates. This, is, this was the topic of Jill McCorkle's talk, that put the US prison population well above all other countries in the world. So I had come across a puzzle, and that was increasing white opioid <coughs> use in the midst of an intensified inner city drug war. So these two graphs more or less aligning. This puzzle has become a part of my study of addiction pharmaceuticals, for which I've observed dozens of drug policy and addiction science meetings, observed interactions in clinics over four years, and interviewed almost 200 addiction scientists, treatment advocates, pharma executives, policy makers, administrators, prescribers, and patients. And I'll give you the punchline up front, which is in my research I discovered an unrecognized form of ethnic marketing that because it targets whites, works by not marking itself as racial. The story is invisible by design, and it was only through sustained participant observation and interviews with key participants that I've been able to unravel its threads. So in my research, I started with the case of buprenorphine, otherwise known as Suboxone. It's easiest to see the racial identity, to, to see its racial identity by comparing it with its predecessor, methadone, the only other opioid that can legally be used to treat opioid dependence in the US. So here's a bar graph from the first and last nationally representative study to compare buprenorphine patients to methadone patients by race and class. I did some follow-up studies with data from New York City that confirmed that these patterns persist. Um, but what we don't know from these graphs, the ones that I just showed, is how these two pharmaceuticals became racialized. That is, by what process have they gained their racial identities? So let's go back to 1965. Thank you. Is it this one that's working? Okay. Let's go back to 1965. So I'll take a, a little bit deeper dive into history. Race riots have burned through Harlem, Philadelphia, and Watts, Los Angeles. Oh, and Watts, Los Angeles. The unemployment rate for blacks is twice that of whites. The mafia gains control of Asian heroin imports and recruits a sales force from black and Latino <coughs> inner cities. Meanwhile, Rockefeller University researcher, he's actually a diabetes researcher, Vincent Dole, who conceptualizes heroin addiction as an opiate receptor deficiency analogous to insulin deficiency in diabetes, publishes findings from the first clinical trial of methadone maintenance. The study's subjects are African-American heroin-injecting men from Harlem, and its outcomes of decreased criminal activity and increased employment at six months brings it national attention. So by 1970, news of methadone as a pharmacological solution to urban heroin reaches President Nixon, who appoints pioneering methadone psychiatrist Jerome Jaffe as the nation's first drug czar. Now Jaffe targets inner city blacks and Latinos as well as returning Vietnam veterans with methadone, the major weapon in Nixon's war on drugs. In order to prevent diversion and street sale of methadone, the DEA regulates methadone clinics requiring daily observed dosing and regular <laughs> urine testing. Due to community resistance, the clinics are located in marginal neighborhoods in the city, remote from other medical services. So let's fast forward for a moment to October 8, 2002. A new kind of opiate problem has developed following Purdue Pharmaceuticals' aggressive marketing of OxyContin as a quote-unquote minimally addictive pain reliever. 
And this is the result. Most of these new addicts are white and many of them middle to upper income. The FDA has just approved the synthetic opioid buprenorphine, commercially packaged as Suboxone for maintenance treatment of opiate dependence in private buprenorphine certified doctor's offices. Pharmacologically similar to methadone in its action in that it blocks opiate receptors in the brains of addicted patients. Buprenorphine can be prescribed monthly for use at home, while methadone is restricted to DEA regulated clinics with directly observed dosing. So this is kind of a landmark. It's the first time since the 1914 Harrison Act that generalist doctors are permitted to use opioids to treat opiate addiction in their offices. The manufacturers of buprenorphine and the architects of buprenorphine policy almost 30 years after methadone had to distinguish buprenorphine symbolically and spatially from the racially burdened and clinically marginalized methadone clinic system. Buprenorphine, pharmacologically the same, in the same drug class as methadone, had to be whitened. So this is Mike. This is um, him in an ad for Suboxone. Uh, it's kind of the opening to a video of him seated in his Ohio diner, flanked by American flags, and talking of his returning to, co to act as coach for his son's ba baseball team and sing in his church choir after buprenorphine rescued him from a prescription opioid habit following a back injury. I argue that this ad was just the tip of the iceberg, that the whiteness of buprenorphine was actively achieved by specific social technologies. And I'll give you my analysis of the contemporary white opioid crisis in terms of what I call technologies of whiteness. Um, so these are social technologies such as policy and industry strategies to maintain racial boundaries around biomedical uses for opioids. The four technologies of whiteness, whiteness that I'm going to discuss include addiction neuroscience, new biotechnologies, regulatory structures, and marketing. I'll start with the least visible technology of race making, and that is brain science. So let's place buprenorphine development, otherwise known as Suboxone, on the backdrop of President Bush the first decade of the brain. This was an era in which NIDA was directed to look for neuromolecular bases for addiction in anticipation of breakthroughs from the Human Genome Project. Alan Leshner, then director of NIDA, lobbied to rebrand addiction as a chronic relapsing brain disease. Leshner's ambition was shared by other leading NIDA researchers who co-authored co this widely cited article in JAMA in 2000 with the title, Drug Dependence, a Chronic Medical Illness. And in it, they argued that narcotics addiction was comparable to diabetes, hypertension, and asthma in terms of heritability, treatment adherence, and relapse rates and that as such, it should be treated in a similar way. The scientists involved in this movement had a social justice intent. They wanted to destigmatize addiction by demonstrating it as a legitimate biological condition. condition. <clears throat> what they didn't see was that scientific universalism, with its implicit assumption of a standard white male subject, and the unequal ways that biotechnologies are disseminated in practice, would actually enhance the social stratification of addiction. Also, taking the scientists' attention away from the social context of pharmaceutical use makes it harder for them to assess the real-world impact of their technologies. So for instance, brain imaging like this, by taking out the subject and his or her trappings of gender, race, class, symbolically reinforce an unmarked universality of addiction physiology. So this apparent universality implies an assumed white norm and excludes social factors. Yet, neuroscientists see themselves as reframing addiction as a brain disease for the very purpose of destigmatizing and decriminalizing drug use by bringing it under the purview of medicine as opposed to the criminal justice system. They want to counteract the punitive drug war mentality by promoting a science that erases the social and racial foundations of drug use, a neurobiological version of colorblind ideology, if you will, um, paradoxically reinforcing the ra racialization of drug policy. So with that, oops, Nora Volkow, <laughs> director of NIDA, I didn't get into that story. Um, I'll go to the next technology, whiteness, which is new biotechnologies. In 1996, Purdue Pharmaceuticals got FDA approval for OxyContin, as I've mentioned, as a minimally addictive pa opioid pain reliever, suitable for chronic management of moderate pain, based on its patented sustained release capsule technology, which in theory lowered the reward for drug abusers, 
by preventing an initial rush. And, and Jill McCorkle did a great job of explaining how that works, that uh, the, the um, speed with which blood concentrations of the drug are released have a lot to do with the way that it's experienced as a high. So this capsule would limit the amount of opioid released in any given time period. At the same time, the National Joint Commission on Hospital Accreditation called for pain to be aggressively monitored and treated as a quote unquote fifth vital sign along with respiratory rate, blood pressure, heart rate. And this helped also to lead to widespread opioid prescriptions for moderate pain, such as that due to lower back injury. Oxycontin users interested in a rush quickly learned to crush and snort or inject the, the oxycodone in each capsule, uh, oxycodone being twice as potent as morphine. So this is the pill. And what happened has been called a public health disaster with vast industries of prescription pill mills cropping up across the country, followed by unprecedented over, op opioid overdose rates. So after steep increases in opioid misuse and overdose, in overdose, public pressure mounted for intervention. And in August of 2010, just as the original patent on OxyContin ran out, and this is a recurring theme, patent uh, law and patent life cycles, Purdue Pharmaceuticals introduced its tamper-resistant time-release formulation of OxyContin, embedding <laughs> oxycodone into polymers that convert tablets into gummies, unusable gummies, should users attempt to crush and dissolve them. So by keeping prices high through the patent and representing OxyContin as technologically sealed off from misuse, the manufacturer strove to keep OxyContin symbolically a step ahead of urban street markets. Another biotechnology developed specifically in re response to white suburban and rural prescription opioid overdose is buprenorphine itself. Commercially released in a combination pill with opioid antagonist naloxone and branded Suboxone, this combination was promoted as a smart drug. Although buprenorphine um, is an abusable opioid, the naloxone with which buprenorphine was combined caused withdrawal symptoms if injected, but not if dissolved under the tongue as prescribed, since naloxone can't be absorbed under the tongue. Buprenorphine also posed a lower risk of overdose death than other opioids, given that it minimally affects breathing. So in the 1990s, NIDA subsidized Nipsuboxone's manufacturer to test it for use in addiction treatment and sharply distinguished it from methadone, lobbying Congress and the DEA to lower the abuse potential rating of Suboxone from the narcotic schedule two, where OxyContin and methadone fall, to schedule three, along with common household products such as coating cough syrup. This made it possible to prescribe Suboxone in generalist doctor's offices. Also, under an orphan drug designation designed to encourage the manufacturer to respond to the opioid crisis in American suburbs, Congress extended the patent on buprenorphine, a drug reg registered in 1972, all the way up to 2009. So in a race and class stratified healthcare system such as that in our country, where access to generalist doctors is often limited to those who can pay, Patented technologies designed for private office delivery in themselves encode white race and middle class. So with that, we'll go to the third technology of whiteness, which is legislation and regulation. Oxycontin and Suboxone now have unprecedented monitoring and certification requirements for prescribers. They stratify access to opioids, and they shift the focus of law enforcement from users to physicians and pharmacies. Although by 2004, prescription opioids overtook heroin as the primary opiate of, opiate of abuse in the US, the arrest rate, and this is again building on Jim, Jill McCorkle's uh, history of this, the arrest for illegal sale of prescription rate of drugs was less than one-fifth of the arrest for selling heroin, although, um, and the arrest rate for um, the illegal possession of prescription opioids was one-fourth that for possession of heroin. Um, not coincidentally, the non-medical use of pain relievers was twice as high among whites as blacks, while the rates of heroin use at that time among blacks, Latinos, and whites were almost identical. <coughs> Since suburban and rural whites were not politically supportable targets for law enforcement, the DEA and other regulators focused their surveillance and enforcement on prescription opioid prescribers and suppliers. One sign of this has been 
the spread of prescription drug monitoring programs, which have been enacted in 49 states, half of which mandate prescriber participation with threats of loss of license and prosecution if the procedures aren't followed for checking to see whether a given patient is already receiving narcotics from another prescriber. Returning to buprenorphine, otherwise known as Suboxone, the Drug, Treatment, Drug Addiction Treatment Act was passed by Congress in 2000 um, and enabled any certified physician, physician, emphasis on certified, to prescribe Suboxone in the privacy of their own offices. In congressional debates leading to the passage of Data 2000, there's a clear emphasis on, quote, a new kind of drug user, one that's young, suburban, and, quote, not hardcore, and implicitly, although the language is coded rather than explicit, white. So Alan Leshner, then director of NIDA, testified that buprenorphine is uniquely appropriate for a new kind of opiate user as opposed to methadone, in quote, uh, he said, which tends to concentrate in urban areas and is a poor fit for the suburban spread of narcotic addiction. In the same congressional hearing, then Health and Human Services Director Donna Shalala, I actually have a photo of her, notes that buprenorphine as an alternative to methadone would serve a new kind of addict, quote, including citizens who would not normally be associated with the term addiction. Data 2000 <coughs> kept the methadone system intact and did nothing to alter the drug laws that mandated many inner city heroin users to prison, but it did create a new treatment track that, for those that had the resources to take advantage of it. To give additional assurance to the DEA that, the, that buprenorphine wouldn't spill over into illicit street markets, Buprenorphine's manufacturer, along with the Federal Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, developed an eight-hour certification course. And I actually took this training in its early days. It's required for doctors to prescribe buprenorphine, and it's the first and only prescription drug in the U.S. to come with that kind of requirement. Public sector doctors tell me that buprenorphine certification um, and patient limits on how many buprenorphine patients can be carried by one prescriber are both major barriers to widening availability of buprenorphine to low-income people, as public clinics do not provide incentives to pursue certification, while prescribers in the private sector can charge fees of up to $1,000 for an initial visit for buprenorphine induction. The shortage of public sector buprenorphine prescribers, along with the cost of buprenorphine, Last I checked, five to nine dollars per tablet or versus 40 cents per dose of methadone have kept buprenorphine in the private sector, largely in the private sector, with some exceptions that are um, growing. Okay, and the last technology of whiteness um, is marketing, ethnic marketing. Oxycontin's legendary commercial success hinged on its designation as a minimally addictive opioid analgesic, as I mentioned. And when Oxycontin was under review at the FDA, Purdue estimated, the, estimated that the addictive potential of Oxycontin is less than 1% based on testing among terminally ill cancer patients over a three month period. Purdue used this designation to sell Oxycontin to new, larger, and therefore lucrative markets of patients with moderate chronic pain hiring a cadre of almost 700 drug reps who canvassed a call list of almost 100,000 physicians, mostly generalists in suburban and rural areas. And this led to a tenfold increase in prescription opioid prescription nationally, uh, with disproportionate uptake in um, white and suburban rural areas of states like Maine, Ohio, Kentucky, and West Virginia. So in a media content analysis that my team completed, we learned that suburbanites addicted to Oxycontin are portrayed sympathetically in the media as victims of overprescription or as people struggling with real or existential pain. Ironically, Purdue's technological response to the first wave of white prescription opioid overdose deaths their tamper-resistant formulations of oxycodone, as I described earlier, combined with new prescription drug monitoring programs, led many of these legal Oxycontin users to look for heroin when pills got hard to get. One consequence of this was a whitening of the media coverage of heroin users who had long been portrayed as black or brown. This is just a couple of images. The targeted intervention for these new heroin users was buprenorphine. Buprenorphine was marketed to middle-class insured patients over the internet, and manufacturer-sponsored web-based web public service announcements featured white professionals and business owners 
on Suboxone maintenance. So this is an image from one of those websites. This same website features a link to a Suboxone prescriber locator service created by the Federal Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And browsers can enter their zip code to generate a list of Suboxone prescribers, most of them in private practice. These strategies created an exclusive yet lucrative segment of the market for Suboxone, making it a blockbuster drug at $1.4 billion in sales in the US in 2012 alone, second only to OxyContin, which reported annual sales of $3 billion. So this racial segmentation of drug markets into licit and illicit, white and black, clinical and recreational, as directed by the war on drugs and by opioid manufacturers, creates a moving target of time-bound patents on new technologies targeting white, the white middle class. And um, this is a fun slide that I have, which um, harkens back to Jill McCorkle's historical narrative, you know, turn of the century historical narrative. The forerunner in this dynamic was Bayer Pharmaceuticals' very own heroin, marketed as a non-addictive treatment for morphine addiction among middle-class Victorian housewives in 1898. So I want to argue that this all could be otherwise. In France, where buprenorphine was adopted for generalist physician treatment of opioid dependence in 1996, it was billed not as a stigma-reducing agent for middle, a middle-class market, but as a public health intervention to stem HIV transmission and overdose among low-income, largely immigrant heroin injectors. As a result, in France, buprenorphine was widely adopted among primary care doctors in poor communities, and the opioid overdose rate in France dropped 80% in the first seven years after buprenorphine's approval. The French example highlights alternatives to the binary of biomedical, versus, biomedical ways of approaching, pharmaceutical ways of approaching um, addiction on the one hand and punitive frames from drug policy. A public health social determinants based approach for example, social determinants of health. Here I'm borrowing from the language of public health. Hopefully it's familiar to lawyers uh, and people working in criminal justice as well. Uh, and it was a subtext of our conversation about drug courts and ways to reformulate things and divert people towards treatment. So a social determinants of health based approach would directly address institutional racism, geography and social class as correlates of addiction. In both of the prevailing US frames of criminal justice and biomedicine, addiction is highly individualized, which makes systemic racialization harder to see and address. So yes, this was my concluding slide. Racially segregated drug policies and lucrative prescription narcotic markets can only be sustained if there's a separate route to categorize and discipline <coughs> drug use among whites. And that route must appear, at least on its surface, to be race neutral. It has costs that are borne by whites who pay inflated prices for new drugs and sometimes pay with their lives. The ambiguity of the Greek word pharmakon, from which pharmaceutical stems, uh, its dual identity as a medicine on the one hand and a poison on the other, is exploited in this white war on drugs that wasn't, in which unprecedented profits are made in the liminal space between licit and illicit sales, a space that's protected by its symbolic whiteness. Thank you.